Thank you very much for that uh, very warm and generous introduction. And my special thanks to the Morale Trustees, the University of York, and of course, all of you. Uh, it's a great honour to give the 2014 Morale Memorial Address with its theme of tolerance. Tonight is an opportunity to explore the tension between tolerance and acceptance. Uh, I've chosen to address the theme of tolerance by specifically reflecting on the work of John Wolfenden with regard to his recommendations for homosexual law reform in the 1950s. <coughs> to see his approach to tolerance and to analyse and critique it. In particular, to look at his often grudging, qualified tolerance towards same-sex relations. Uh, Wolfenden's understanding of tolerance often fell well short of the claim by LGBT people for true equality and acceptance. As I'm sure you know, in September 1957, the Wolfenden Committee recommended an end to the total ban on male homosexuality <coughs> in Britain, but favoured only a very partial decriminalisation. In other words, a grudging tolerance, and certainly not a legalisation or acceptance. Uh, John Wolfenden, the committee's chair, is often hailed as a great liberal reformer. In fact, he opposed homosexual equality and obstructed attempts by fellow committee members to produce a fair and just report. Indeed, the flawed proposals of the 1957 Wolfenden report contributed to the subsequent half-baked, partial decriminalisation of sex between men ten years later in 1967 with the passage of the Sexual Offences Act. Much of the blame for the deficiencies of this law reform rests personally and directly with John Wolfenden. Far from being the patron saint of homosexual emancipation, as he is sometimes depicted, he was in fact a cautious conservative who found homosexuality distasteful and who wanted only minimal changes in the law. <coughs> Gay rights veterans from the period, such as Anthony Gray and Alan Horsfall, who campaigned in the 1950s and 60s for the implementation of the Northern Report, had very mixed feelings about his role. They say it's wrong to judge Wolfenden by today's standards. And perhaps, to some extent, they are right. Um, they say that he was more cautious than he could or should have been. Uh, but nevertheless, in the 1950s, his recommendations were considered radical and some considerable way ahead of often bigoted, ill-informed public opinion. Now, despite the report's inadequacies, both Gray and Horsfall argue that it did give the gay community a valuable springboard from which to campaign for law reform and for greater social acceptance. I have some considerable sympathy for their perspective. I'm mindful of the climate in the 1950s. I'm mindful of the pressures on Wolfenden. I'm mindful of how difficult a minefield he was treading through. In those days, lurid press reporting of a series of high-profile gay trials in the early 1950s, 
including those of Lord Montague and John Gilgood, had turned the public spotlight on sexual relations between men, provoking very strong opposing reactions. Liberals demanded a change in the law to end blackmail and imprisonment, while conservatives urged a crackdown on what they condemned as a tide of immorality. In response to these pressures, in 1954, the then Conservative Home Secretary, Sir David F Maxwell Fife, announced the setting up of a Home Office inquiry. He appointed 47-year-old John Wolfenden, the Vice-Chancellor of Reading University, as Chair of the Committee on Homosexuality and Prostitution, hoping that far from recommending reform, it would come back with proposals for the successful suppression of what he saw as escalating homosexual debauchery. After three years' deliberation, the Wolfenden Report was published in 1957. It argued that homosexual acts should not be prosecuted providing they took place in private, with consent, and involved no more than two men, both aged 21 or over. There was never any question of the legalization of same-sex acts. That was not even on the agenda. It was a partial decriminalization, not a legalization. Now, the Wolfen Report did not urge the repeal of anti-gay laws, merely a policy of non-prosecution in certain very limited circumstances. Uh, the existing, often centuries-old laws were to remain on the statute books under the heading as was, quote, unnatural offences. This advocacy of limited decriminalisation within rather narrow restrictive circumstances reiterated and perpetuated anti-gay discrimination. As well as proposing a gay age of consent five years higher than the heterosexual limit of 16, the Wolfenden Report recommended the maximum penalty for a man aged 21 or over who was convicted of oral sex or masturbation with a 16 to 21 year old male should be increased from two years to five years. So an escalation in legal penalties in that scenario, not a diminution. Both of these proposals, the unequal age of consent and the increased penalties for oral or, oral or mutual masturbation with a 16 to 21 year old male, both of these were incorporated into the subsequent law reform, the 1967 Sexual Offences Act. Wolfenden never even considered the decriminalisation of homosexual cruising and cottaging, i.e. the crime of men meeting in public with the intention of later having sexual relations, or the crime of same-sex acts in parks or public toilets, even if they took place in deserted remote locations in the middle of the night, unwitnessed by members of the public. So the offence of soliciting for an immoral purpose, which criminalised any attempt in a public place for gay men to meet each other, remained uh, an offence and was never supported for reform by the Wolfenden Committee. Uh, moreover, the invitation, procuring, facilitation 
and aiding and abetting of homosexuality, including some forms of sex between men that had been decriminalized, remained subject to the full force of the long-standing criminal law. So they have a scenario where John Wolferton recommended XYZ changes, but not to end the criminalization of inviting, procuring, facilitating, or aiding and abetting a homosexual act, even in some circumstances, what was to become a lawful one. All of this discriminatory legislation remained on the statute books until 2003. Until 2003. Home Office transcripts of the internal deliberations of the Walton Committee provide a unique insight into the thinking of John Wolfenden and other committee members, revealing a big battle between those who wanted little or no change in the law and others who are much more critical of the way the criminal justice system treated gay and bisexual men. <coughs> Wolfenden, it appears, was often an obstacle to progressive reform. On three key issues, he played a negative role. When committee members discussed the age of consent in 1955, Wolfenden was aghast to discover that seven wanted an age of consent of 18, one advocated 17, the Tory MP Sir Hugh Linstead, and only three supported his proposal of 21. Wolfenden remained adamant that he would never put his name to a report advocating anything other than 21 as the age of consent, effectively pressuring the majority to abandon their endorsement of a lower age limit. The basis of Wolfenden's support for 21 was his belief in seduction and corruption theories of homosexuality. In particular, he was concerned about the effects of national service, suggesting that poorly paid young conscript soldiers needed protection from older, wealthier homosexuals who might tempt them into sex with presents and financial inducements. Now, influenced by three sensationally reported gay show trials involving young servicemen, Wolfenden demanded a five-year differential in the age of consent. I think it's arguable that without his zealous insistence, an effective veto, um, the final report may well have recommended 18 rather than 21. Equally shocking, Wolfenden wanted to keep anal sex, the so-called offence of buggery, totally illegal in all circumstances, even between consenting adults in private. He also favoured retaining the option of punishing anal, anal sex with life imprisonment. So, at the time, male homosexuality was punishable by a maximum sentence of life imprisonment. John Walton wanted to keep it that way when it came to anal sex. Although overwhelmingly outvoted by fellow committee members, Walton still inserted into the report the following words. We believe that there is some case for retaining buggery as a separate offence. And there may even be a case for retaining the present maximum penalty of life imprisonment in really serious cases. Wolfenden also played a crucial role in watering down criticism of the police by other committee members, exonerating officers over their use of argent provocateurs 
in parks and public toilets. This is where police officers would, young, handsome police officers, would be dressed up in a camp, effeminate way, would be sent into a park of public toilet to lure gay men into committing same-sex acts and then be promptly arrested. Defending the police, Wolfenden claimed, quite untruthfully I think, that the committee was, quote, on the whole favourably impressed by the way officers carried out their, quote, unpleasant task. <laughs> His sanction of undercover operations as, quote, legitimate, gave them the nod of official approval. <coughs> if he had exposed and condemned such tactics instead, police entrapment may have declined rather than subsequently increasing. And thousands of gay and bisexual men could have been spared arrest. The private exchanges between committee members reveal Wolfenden as quite intolerant and reactionary <coughs> compared to the academic Gromwe Weeds, the Tory MP Sir Hugh Lindstedt, the solicitor Kenneth Diplock, and the doctors Desmond Curran and Joseph Whitby. Both doctors wanted an age of consent of 18 and condemned what they saw as the police persecution of gay men. Time and time again, their critical and effective questioning of ill-informed homophobic witnesses was cut short by Wolfenden interjecting to divert the inquiry onto other issues. He seemed intent on coming to the aid of the embattled voices of unreason and intolerance. Could Wolfenden have been more radical? Anthony Gray, who was active in the Homosexual Law Reform Society from 1958, is doubtful. This is what he told me, and I quote, the report was surprisingly liberal given that most of the evidence presented to the committee was terribly homophobic. Wolfenden received very few positive submissions that might have inclined him to a more favourable view. The evidence from professional bodies was indeed woefully bigoted and generally hostile to law reform. The British Medical Association depicted homosexuality as a contagion sometimes spread by contact with foreigners. <laughs> it declared, the BMA declared, homosexuality is, and I quote, an enemy of the state, and quote, attached to an alien ideology. <laughs> Heterosexuality was, it suggested, quote, the basis and strength of democracy. Openly gay men were the worst, quote, an outrage to public decency. One solution proposed by the BMA was cure through, quote, religious conversion. Another involved the creation of secure units for observation and treatment. The BMA proposed that unreformable homosexuals were possibly psychopaths and should be isolated in psychiatric prison colonies. The British Medical Association was advocating the creation of special penal prison colonies where unreformable homosexuals should be incarcerated for life. According to the Tavistock Clinic, gay men were, I quote, immature, sick, and potentially infectious. Homosexuality was, quote, an illness and, quote, a public health problem comparable to tuberculosis. 
offering a predatory model of homosexual recruitment, it suggested that what it called experienced homosexuals possessed what it called certain antennae by which they could recognize the vulnerable. <laughs> The British Psychological Society proclaims same-sex relations as, quote, a sign of immaturity. It feared the corruption of youth, expressing concern that a teenager who had, quote, a satisfying homosexual experience would not move on to heterosexuality. In other words, it could potentially be enjoyable and that may ensure that person had a happy, fulfilled homosexual life and not able to go on to be heterosexual, which it saw as the ultimate desirable goal. From the Institute of Psychiatry came the opinion that gay men were mentally ill and, quote, on the edge of a lot of trouble socially. The Bar Council spoke of, quote, the danger to youth, and call for the setting up of special penal institutions for men twice or more convicted of sex with males under 21. The traitor theme was pushed by the Law Society, which warned the committee of the, quote, damage to the state if these tendencies get too strong a hold describing sex between men as a, quote, <coughs> a very considerable evil, the Law Society cautioned against decriminalization. The Howard League for Penal Reform, the Bar Council, and the Royal Medico Psychological Society urged compulsory pre-sentencing psychiatric examinations for men convicted of homosexual offences. Despite the danger that these examinations might reveal further offences and implicate the person in guilt and thereby implying judges to pass even harsher sentences. This did not matter, said Gerald Gardner of Labour Lawyers. It was legitimate he argued, to violate the civil rights of homosexuals if this contributed to their cure. Now, given the preponderance of outrageous homophobic evidence, Anthony Gray concluded, and I quote, the Wolf and the Report had some shortcomings, but it wasn't regarded by us as disappointing or reactionary. And as I said, I can understand that perspective in the 1950s and 1960s, given the state of public opinion and the uh, incredibly homophobic views expressed by these learned professional bodies. But nevertheless, I disagree. I disagree with Anthony Gray. Although it's true that most submissions to the committee were hostile, the anti-gay arguments were flimsy, not evidence-based, and could have been refuted by evidence and good argument. There was potential for the report to be more radical, given that it had significant strong minority evidence on which to base progressive recommendation. So there were people on that committee, who, as you've heard, were dissenting and were offering a more progressive set of proposals. It's true that a more liberal, tolerant report would have received a lot of criticism, but the committee got that criticism anyway. Now, despite his failings, to his credit, Wolfenden did recommend the repeal of the total ban on gay sex, against the wishes of the homophobic Home Secretary, Sir David Maxwell Fyfe. Um, this was commendable. 
especially coming from an instinctively conservative establishment figure. It also took considerable courage for Wolfenden to advocate a change in the law, given that he had a flamboyant gay son, Jeremy Wolfenden, and was therefore vulnerable to media exposure and ridicule. Some people, of course, speculate that Wolfenden's support for decriminalization was influenced by Jeremy's gayness. However, as Sebastian Fox argued in his book, The Fatal Englishman, Wolfenden abhorred homosexuality. And his endorsement of reform was not because of any sympathy for Jeremy's sexual orientation. Indeed, Wolfenden reacted very badly to his son's homosexuality, according to Fox. Jeremy described the relationship with his father as, quote, tense, uneasy, artificial peace that makes home intolerable. Sebastian Fultz concluded, and I quote, Wolfenden personally abhorred homosexuality. He thought it was a disgusting abomination. His suggestion that homosexuality be decriminalized <coughs> was a victory for intellectual process over personal distaste. So, was John Wolfenden a saint or sinner? Was he a paragon of tolerance and virtue or not? Anthony Gray says, he wanted reform, but was also realistic about what was possible in that period. He avoided being too radical, fearing that it would lead to the report being pushed aside. Now, I demure. Uh, I respect greatly Anthony Gray, one of the great icons of the gay, gay report, law reform movement in the 1950s and 60s. But I think, as we've seen in the evidence I presented, Wolferden so often did obstruct reform and express his own personal, quite prejudiced, homophobic views. So, when I look at the evidence, based on the internal notes and the conversations and correspondence between the committee members, the evidence we now have released by the Home Office, my conclusion is that Wolfram was often eager to appease moralists by suggesting, for example, that homosexuality was partly a matter of, quote, self control. Comparable quote, to the extent to which coughing can be controlled. <laughs> this illiberal side was also evident when Peter Wildblood testified to the committee. He had been jailed for gay sex in 1954 in one of the big show trials of that period. The irate fury with which Wolfenden annotated Wildblood's pro-law reform submission indicates his deep antipathy to and lack of sympathy for gay and bisexual men. This was also reflected in the way he treated Alan Horsfall, founder of the Northwest Homosexual Law Reform Committee in 1964, the first grassroots <coughs> membership organization by and for gay people. Horsfall was scathing about Wolfenden's refusal to endorse campaigns for the implementation of the report. And this is what he told me, and I quote, he, Wolfenden, refused to send a message of support to a public meeting he organized in Manchester in 1966 to discuss his proposal. Once the report was finished, Wolfenden washed his hands of it. He didn't want anything more to do with homosexual law reform, <laughs> said Horsfall. My conclusion, John Wolfenden was a voice for reform. He did promote a certain tolerance, but he was also a voice for a reluctant, a reluctant limited tolerance of homosexuality. 
Nevertheless, perhaps, his hedged, hesitant tolerance was also a necessary stepping stone towards the large measure of acceptance that LGBT people now enjoy today. Whatever our view, British LGBT people have now achieved near legal equality. All these years later, despite the flaws of the 1967 Sexual Offences Act, the fact that the legislation was not extended to Scotland until 1980 and not to Northern Ireland until 1982, despite all those failings, we have now reached a place of almost equal rights in law. But let's remember that serious gay law reform only began in 1999. Until that year, Britain had by volume the largest number of anti-gay laws, some of them dating back centuries, of any country in the world. Of any country in the world. You know, most aspects of gay male life remained criminalized. The decriminalization was very narrow, very partial, very limited. As you probably know, in 1999, the first major gay law reform took place with the ending of the ban on gay and lesbian people serving in the armed forces. As a result of a negative judgment in the European Court of Human Rights, which ruled that such discrimination was unlawful. This was followed by a similar judgment in the European Court of Human Rights, which ruled that the unequal age of consent, 21 rather than 16, was also <coughs> unlawful discrimination. And then there followed a whole series of other reforms. Uh, the repeal of Section 28, the right of same-sex couples to foster and adopt children, legislation to protect um, LGBT people against discrimination in employment and the provision of goods and services, including housing, advertising, and so on. We also, of course, saw the passage of civil partnerships in 2004-2005. Um, in 2003, all the old historic anti-gay laws were repealed. So, you remember the case of Oscar Wilde, sent to prison uh, in 1895, on a charge of gross indecency with men, gross indecency being inflammatory, bigoted language which merely describes any sexual contact between men other than anal intercourse. That law was only repealed in 2003. It remained on the statute books under the heading unnatural offences until 11 years ago. Likewise, the law against so-called buggery, anal sex, passed in 1533 during the reign of King Henry VIII was only repealed in 2003. But hey, we now have a great measure of equality. All those different laws have gone. We now even have same-sex marriage. This is a huge turnaround in a phenomenally short space of time. You know, we have gone to being, certainly in European terms, one of the most homophobic countries legally, in terms of statute, to being one of the best countries in the world. And that is a huge tribute to the tens of thousands of LGBT people and our straight friends and allies who have campaigned over the years. But it didn't begin 10, 15 or 20 years ago. It began way back in the 1950s and 1960s with the Wolfenden Report, the campaign to get it implemented, and the consequent campaign to further extend law reform. The fact that that huge hiatus took place from 1967 through to 1999 is a pretty damning indictment of our democratic policy. But hey, we've done it. We have done it. And it is in my estimation, the fastest, most successful law reform campaign in British history and possibly world history. I can't think of 
such a wide range of diverse laws that discriminate being repealed in such a short space of time. Literally, since 1999, in just over a decade. That is an extraordinary, phenomenal, pretty much unprecedented campaign of successful reform. So now we have Britain with some of the world's best LGBT legislation. But of course, it's still not quite equal. We have moved mountains, but there's a few foothills yet to traverse. Um, all our fantastic equality laws have qualified limited exemptions for religious organizations. Not just places of worship, but also faith-run schools, hospitals, nursing homes, shelters for the homeless, and so on. All of them have exemptions for faith organizations if they can demonstrate that to give LGBT people equal rights would go against their religious ethos. So they're entitled to discriminate in employment and in the provision of services if they can show that it's necessary to maintain their religious ethos. We also, of course, have same-sex marriage. But it's not, by a long shot, equal marriage. We now have two separate marriage statutes the 1949 Marriage Act, which is for opposite-sex couples only, and the 2013 Marriage Act, which is for same-sex couples only. So there is segregation in marriage law. The law segregates marriage into gay and straight. We didn't need to do that. The ban on same-sex marriage was only introduced in 1971 under the Nullity of Marriage Act. Prior to that time, there was no ban on same-sex marriage. The 1949 Marriage Act does not stipulate that marriage partners have to be male and female. The ban was only introduced in 1971 to stop same-sex couples, and in particular, couples where one partner was transgender, from either getting married or getting restitution in the case of divorce. Many of you will be familiar with the case of April Ashley, um, whose struggle to get her marriage recognized uh, culminated in this legislation, this punitive ban on same-sex marriage. The Knowledge of Marriage Act prohibition was subsequently transferred into the Matrimonial Causes Act of 1973. All the government had to do was repeal the ban <coughs> under the Matrimonial Causes Act and revert to the 1949 Marriage Act. There's no need for two separate marriage laws. So we still have this anomaly. We also have the anomaly in terms of pension inheritance in the event of one partner dying. Uh, broadly speaking, in the case of a heterosexual marriage under the 1949 Act, if one partner dies, the surviving partner can inherit inherit their deceased partner's pension from the date they began contributing to it, which may be 1960 or 1970. In the case of the 2013 Marriage Act for Same-Sex Couples, and indeed the Civil Partnership Act of 2004 for Same-Sex Couples, the legal entitlement to inherit pension from a deceased partner is only backdated to 2005. So a same-sex civil partner or marriage partner may have contributed to their pension pot since 1960, but under the law, they only have an automatic entitlement for their surviving partner to inherit their pension contributions from 2005 onwards. So in other words, they could lose 20, 30 or more years of pension inheritance for the surviving partner. Clearly, that is not equality. That is discrimination. Um, in terms of public acceptance, again, we have moved a long way. But it's very interesting to note that the British Social Attitude Survey of a couple of years ago found that even today, 36% of the British public still believe that homosexuality is mostly or always wrong. Mostly or always wrong. 
36%. Now, that's a big improvement on the 1980s when the country was gripped by homophobic witch hunts and the gay plague hysteria, when the figure was actually two-thirds of the public believed that. But still one-third, that, that's, that's a very substantial minority. The silver lining is that I suspect that some of those people who took that view may hold the view that, yes, homosexuality is always or mostly wrong, but they wouldn't actualize it. They wouldn't, they wouldn't lead them to take action to discriminate. They may personally believe it, but I doubt in many instances whether they would actively discriminate. I think more research is required on that one. So my conclusion is that um, we have moved from a period of grudging, limited tolerance to an atmosphere, a public sphere, where there is greater acceptance. Nowadays, when same-sex couples marry, albeit under a flawed legislation, most people in this country think fine. There's no great outrage or human crime. You know, contrary to what the opponents of same-sex marriage said, civilization has not collapsed. <laughs> the country has continued <laughs> as before, and most people are just quite relaxed and happy that people who love each other, who happen to be of the same sex, can take the option of marriage if that's what they wish. So I think we have moved a long way from the days of the book of the report, from tolerance to acceptance, and that is a very good thing. Thank you.